Well, Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for this wonderful day that we're enjoying together. We thank you for your word today, God, that is going to go forth, Lord. And we want to learn. We want to receive from you today, God. So we open our hearts and we, uh, we welcome you to bring new insight to our lives so we know that what the Spirit is doing today in the church, God. Let us see it and know it and understand it. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Wow. So this, this is, uh, it's been a crazy few days. My wife has been away. And you know, how many know that until your wife leaves, you don't realize how much she does, right? So she's, uh, she's been away and in Ottawa, so at a women's conference with a few of the ladies. And um, so I've been kind of pulling, pulling a lot. So I didn't even get a chance to print out my notes, but we'll go right from my computer this morning. But I want to talk today about coming to the table. Coming to the table is the title of my message. And, um, you know, when you look back in time, you remember when you were a child, um, you, you probably have moments where your family got together and had fellowship. So, so many times today, people, you know, they grab their meal and, you know, they sit by the TV and there's less and less family communion that takes place at the table like in the olden days. How many hear what I'm saying? And I think it's important that we, we cherish and value that time because there's something to be said about eating together, right? And so, but you know, I remember when I was a child, um, you know, I, I, one memory that comes to my mind is when we used to go over to my Aunt May's place, okay? Now, my mother has 18 siblings, so we, were, we didn't need friends outside the family. We had tons of friends within the family, right? So, you know, we'd go over to my aunt's place, and the uncles and the aunts would all get together. And you know what I found was that uh, the, the adult table was boring. I used to sit. It was so reserved, and I didn't enjoy it. But we had a kid's table. How many remember the kid's table, Right? And so we would sit at the, at, the kids, at the kids' table, and we used to have this thing that some of you younger people don't understand. We had this thing called Kool-Aid, and this is what we drank. So when we, when we came in, we were sweating and, you know, just playing outside. We come in, we didn't say, Mom, I need water. We came and said, Mom, I need some Kool-Aid or Freshy. You were either a Freshy fan or a Kool-Aid fan. How many remember? And, and, and it was great. It was a great product. It was basically food coloring and two cups of sugar. And this is what we'd give our kids. How many know? I was raised on this stuff. I think the first time I had a glass of water, I was probably, you know, 14. I mean, it was like Kool-Aid, right? Kool-Aid and milk. And that's what we drank. And so the problem with Kool-Aid is that we'd get all, you know, jacked up on this stuff and just be like, you know, and we, we were always hyped. So we'd sit at the kids' table, and, and it became a thing when we went to the cousins where I would literally, my goal was to make somebody laugh hysterically. And I tried to do it at the point when they were drinking their Kool-Aid. <laughs> and there's nothing more exciting than seeing Kool-Aid come out to two nasal passages all over the table. <laughs> and you got points for that. And if you could get someone to, you know, when they were eating and you have a broccoli stem come out of someone's nostril, you were like, yes! You know, and it was always a mess all over the table and the parents were upset. But the kids' table was cool. I liked it. Um, I love the kids' table. Um, because the big table was too serious. But you know what? The Bible talks a lot about tables. Tables are very significant in the scripture. We see that um, tables were a place of fellowship. Tables were a place of communion where people would get together and commune. Tables were a place uh, of feasting. It was a place to, to have food. Tables were a place for nourishment and strength. And the Bible is full of stories about significant tables. You know, Once upon a time, there was a table called the table of showbread. How many know that if you go back into the Old Testament, there was a table of showbread that was in the tabernacle. It was a small table. It was made of acacia wood, and um, it, o it was overlaid with pure gold. It was founded in the tabernacle of David, okay? And uh, it stood at the right side of the Holy of Holies, and it held 12 loaves, which represented the 12 tribes of Israel. So there's different tribes. How many know there's different tribes? How many know that, you know, you need to be part of a tribe, and you need to thrive in your tribe? So, and it's the same today. God, God pours out vision and mantle and, and mission for one local church, but he also calls out mantle and mission for another local church. And so we're all in this together. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? And so God has, had, had did this. He had the showbread, which meant the bread of his presence. That's what the table of showbread was all about. It represented God's desire to have communion with humanity. God always wanted to regain communion with mankind. And that's what the showbread, table of showbread represented. Now, once upon a time, there was also a table in the upper room. We read in the upper room that uh, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. How many remember that passage? Jesus would say this. He was born in Bethlehem, which means the house of 
bread, okay? And so he broke bread with his children. He broke bread in fellowship. Why? To restore communion between God, the Father, and humanity. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And so there was this communion and this fellowship that Jesus was, he was longing for this moment to have communion with his disciples. Can you see that? Okay, so Jesus broke, his broken body is our only access to fellowship with God. It's, it's our only access is through the broken body of Jesus Christ. Once upon a time, there was a, t- there was a table at a wedding feast. Okay, and we see this in Revelations. It's a table to come, say a table to come. And it says this, um, Then I heard again what sounded like a shout of a vast crowd, or a roar of a mighty ocean, waves, a crash of a loud thunder. Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. And so we're preparing ourselves to meet at a table, a wedding banquet table, with our Lord and Savior. Amen? This is awesome. This is what God is, God is planning. This is what it's all about. It's about this wedding feast. It's about sitting at a table. And guess what? You're not going to have your iPod to distract your iPads, and you're going to be having fellowship. You know, a table under the old covenant, a table that ushered in the new covenant, and then a table that celebrates the wedding of Jesus and his church. And so tables are significant in the scripture. All right, And um, one thing that Camilla and I have realized is it's one thing to have someone come to your door and, and chat with you. How many of you ever had you know, that at-the-door chat with the neighbor, right? And there's an acquaintance, there's a relationship where you're just getting acquainted with somebody, okay? But it's another thing to invite someone in for a coffee. How many know that you know, they come in and they start to see your mess, right? But it's a whole other realm to invite someone for dinner, Dinner is so significant, okay? Why? Because there's a real vulnerability when you invite someone for dinner. Because first of all, they're going to see your kitchen. They're going to see your mess, all right? Now, Camilla's, Camilla's not here today, so don't, don't tell her I told you this, okay? We will delete it from the video. But, you know, when you guys come for dinner, sometimes we have four kids. I know with four kids, things aren't always, you know, immaculate. And you'll come in and you'll say, oh, this house is so clean. I wish I had a house that was clean like this. And you look through it, we don't show you the bedroom, because if you open the bedroom, everything that was in the house is now in the bedroom, okay? You see, see what I'm saying? Anyone can relate to that, okay? She's going to shoot me for telling you that, but you know. But, but how many know that when there's, there's vulnerability when, <laughs> when people come over, right? Okay? Um, because people might see your mess. You know, the kids might act up. Man, sometimes you're like sitting at the table and you're thinking... You know, I hope my kids are really well behaved. And, and they usually are until you have guests, and now they have something to fight about at the table, and you're just like, oh, my goodness. Hannah, Hannah, Hannah. I'm just teasing her, okay? Sorry. But how many know what it, you're thinking? Okay, I hope the kids don't act up, right? And uh, they, you know what happens when people come over? They see your imperfections as a family, don't they? And here's the other thing is we see your imperfections, right? Because you're starting to have communion. You're starting to do life with one another, okay? But um, that invite also says something, says something else very significant. It says that um, you're welcome here. It says we want you here. It says uh, you're important to us, and it costs us something. We want to take of our sustenance, and we want to bless you. We want you to come into this thing. How many hear what I'm saying? And we invite you to see who we really are. So eating dinner together is important. Getting together, tables represent a great thing, okay? So when someone comes to your front door and you chat for a couple minutes, there's a level of acquaintance. If you have someone over for tea or coffee, you can still keep it nice and clean. How many know what I'm saying? Okay? You can only show them what you want to show them. You can put your kids to bed before they show up, so you don't have to worry about that, right? You can clean up the, the parts of the house your guests have access to. You can do all this stuff. But when someone comes for a meal, when someone comes together, you know what? There's always a mess that comes with a meal. And people see your real life. How many hear what I'm saying this morning? There's always cleanup afterwards. Um, but there's always one thing. There's great food. 
and great dessert. Unless you visit someone who doesn't know how to cook, and we won't go there. <laughs> but God is good anyway. So, so in many ways, the church, the church is, is, is like that table. It's a place of vulnerability. It's a place where um, you have to be vulnerable, and you've got to let the mask down. You've got to say, hey, this is who I really am. Uh, you, because, because here's the thing. Vulnerability is a place. It's a very powerful place. Vulnerable, uh, vulnerable people are a powerful people. Why? Because they recognize their need for God. So when we're vulnerable, we're telling people, hey, listen, I don't have all my stuff together, but I'll tell you this. I'm in progress, and I love Jesus, and I want to do life with you. That's what you're saying. The next verse I want to bring up is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7. It says, now we have this light. Okay, this is Paul speaking, shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. And that's what you show people when we get vulnerable. Hey, listen, none of us have it all together. We're on progress. We're loving Jesus together. We're encouraging one another. We're moving forward. And how many know that's a great place to be? And that's what God has called the church to be, a place like this. The table of showbread was a vulnerable because people had to recognize their sinfulness before a holy God. And so the table in the upper room was vulnerable because they had to recognize their hopefulness, hopelessness without Jesus. Jesus was about to go to the cross. The table of the wedding feast is vulnerable because we have to recognize eternity in light of our communion with or without God. And so there's always a place of vulnerability when you come to the table. So at the Crossroads Church, I believe we're like a table. We have a meal to present, okay? And how do we do, what do we do when guests come into our house? What do we do? They're coming to our house, they're coming to our church, they're coming for dinner. What do we do? We want to make sure that they're treated right. How do we treat them? How do we act? What do we say? So there's a very big importance on guest services and how we, how we connect with people as they're coming in. First impressions are very, very, how many know first impressions are really, really important? Okay? Everyone should greet guests, not just the greeters. Because what people are looking for today is they're looking for organic. They're looking for the real deal. So if you were to come to my house, I have four kids, and you were to come to my house, and I had two of my kids greet you at the door. Hey, how are you? Nice to have you. And the other two people didn't say hi to you, the other two kids. Wouldn't that be awkward? That's not natural. You're just doing it because it's your job. Because you you'll get grounded if you don't. You know what I mean? Everyone should be a greeter. If you're in this church, if you, especially if you're a partner, you're a greeter. You need to be looking for new people and say, hey, how's it going? You're welcome here. We, we're glad you're here because we're a family. And we're welcoming, welcoming people to our table. Does that make sense to anybody? Okay. And so um, have you ever had a guest over and put the focus entirely on yourself? Have you ever done that? Could you imagine someone came over to visit your house and you came in and you're like, you're serving your own food, you're sitting down and, and uh, you know, you're just forgetting about your guests? Could you imagine what that would be like? But when we begin to see church as a banquet table where people are coming in, we begin to prefer others before ourselves. We begin to say, hey, have a seat. Let me help you. Let, you, know, how, you know, can I pray with you? You begin to think of others and you begin to commune with others. No longer is the church just about what you can get. It's about what you can give. Because we're a family and we're welcoming people into this family because God is constantly trying to adopt people into his family. It's his desire that none would perish, that all would come to the saving knowledge of his son. Is that not true? And so this is what we want to do. Okay? And so, so uh, g g you know, great churches make guests feel great. And so we always want to have this church make guests feel great. We want to do different things that are going to help people feel involved. Actually, one of the things we're going to be doing starting in November um, is we have someone in the church who's volunteered to put together a list that people can sign up and invite people from, um, from to dinner at their homes, and we can start inviting each other for dinner so we can get to be vulnerable and get to know each other at a deeper level. Wouldn't that be exciting? And so you can sign up and invite people, or you can be invited, and just to build a deeper relationship, something we're looking at for November. So, you know, another thing, another way to a guest's heart is the food, right? The food is another way to the guest's heart. 
So if you have good food, people are going to come. Okay? So our mission, we bring up our mission here, is live like Jesus and share his love. That's kind of all we want to do as a church. Because I think you're in a safe place when you go back to the Gospels and you say, okay, Jesus said I'm here. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm representing what the Father's like. So let's follow Jesus' example. Right? Let's, let's treat the, the sinner the way Jesus did. Let's deal with religion the way Jesus did. Let's be caring and compassion. Let's heal people like Jesus did. So we're living like Jesus. We're sharing his love. That's our mission. We want to become like Christ. We want him to come through us. Does that make sense? That's our mission as a church. Next, moving on. Our values, I'm just going to run through a few of them, is we're presence-driven worship. We want, you know, we've had certain people come and just like, well, we're not into the lifting of hands and the clapping and the, you know, the long worship sets and all that. But to us, it's important. We value that. How many draw, like leave church and just feel closer to God? Let me see your hands. We value the presence of God. We value worship. We value, this is something we value as a church. And there's no, we won't compromise in that area. We value the word of God. You'd be surprised at how many churches today won't preach certain scriptures. Because it might have, well, I believe that this is the full counsel of God and I'm going to teach it. Amen? This is the Word of God. We value the Word of God. We value relational discipleship. We, it's so important to me that, you know, you guys go to, to, to help one another grow and to mentor one another. You, it shouldn't just be the pastor. There has to be relational discipleship. That's why we do connect groups. Uh, honor and character is very important. Innovation and creativity. We want to just have an excellent spirit. We want to be able to innovate, take the same message, keep it pure, but innovate to, re- to reach the next generation. Amen? So these things are important to us as a church. Let's move on. Our discipleship process is, um, um, is, is our connect groups, of course. Encounter weekends, the highway to wholeness, which we're introducing, I just shared about. And the Purple Book, which if you want to go through, uh, you're newly saved and you want to learn more about the doctrines of the Bible, we have a thing called the Purple Book. Talk to one of us. We'll get you set up, okay? So, so this is, uh, this is, these are some of the discipleship processes that we have, okay? And uh, our ministries, go to the next one, is we have Kids Alive, which is our kids' ministry upstairs. As you know, today is the first Sunday that they went up before the worship, and they're going to st- so we can make up some more. We still need more room, but we're growing as a church, so we had to free up some chairs. So they're upstairs uh, doing worship upstairs. Um, the zone, which is the preteens, did I get that right? The zone. I think it's called the zone. <laughs> just they just named it. Uh, the preteen outreach on Tuesday night. Youth actually starts this Tuesday night. So if you're a youth, you need to be at that. When, uh, we have men and women's breakfasts. We have Cuba missions. There's a Cuba mission trip coming up in November. If you want to go, talk to me. Uh, prayer ministry. We have a prayer ministry on Wednesday that is just exploding, isn't it? How many go to the prayer? I think we had 18 here on Wednesday praying and interceding for the church. And so these are exciting times, aren't they? So we got all of this. And this, this actually, this is our appetizer, our main course, our dessert. It's our refreshments. It's the meal that we present so that we can, we can nourish people as they come into the body of Christ. Okay? And so the food is great, but we have to recognize who's sitting at our table. That's very important. Who is sitting at our table? Can we talk about that? That's in my way, so I'm just going to move it. We have four different types of people. We have the curious. So I'm going to ask someone maybe to come sit over here at, at my dinner table. Can I have a, a volunteer? Chris, would you come? Have a seat? All right. He's curious. So then we have the curious. Now, then we have the connected. This is another group of people. So I'm going to have another adult come up. Who would like to come? Would you come, Hannah? You want to come sit at the table? No, she doesn't want to sit at the table. Okay. Bill, come on, brother. Bill is the connected. Come have a seat. Yeah, put it on like a bib so everybody can see it. It's good. Then we have the committed. Who wants to be a committed? You want to come be a committed? Okay, come on. This is awesome. You can sit. Um, you sit there, and she's going to sit here because there's an order to the madness here. There you go. You don't have to wear it as a bib. You can just hold it up. Okay. All right. So then we have one more group, one more chair at the table. It's called the catalyst. So who wants to be our catalyst? Linda. There you go. 
All right, have a seat, and I'll try to explain this to you so it makes sense. So we have, we have um, four types of people sitting at our table. The table is the local church. I'm sorry that we don't have a stage to get them higher, but I'll try to. Um, but there's four people. There's the curious, there's the connected, there's the committed, and there's a the catalyst, okay? So the, the, the first chair is the curious. The curious, it says right there, it's all about the meals. So there's some people that just come to church, and they're curious. They just want to hear the gospel. They want to hear this new thing that they're hearing. I'm curious. And, you know, sometimes curious people are also on YouTube watching all kinds of other spiritual mumbo-jumbo stuff, and they come, and they, they don't know where left from right sometimes, but they're curious. They're coming. They want to hear the message. They're coming to the church for the first time. They're curious, okay? And so, the, the, you know, they're, they're all concerned about the meal. What can I get? Do I like the message? The second person here, hold up your shine here, Bill. This is, this is, the, this is the connected person. And it's all about the ministry. So the connected person is the person that it's like, you know, this is my small group. I'm on this worship team. And I'm committed to the ministries within the church. Does that make sense? So I'm involved, okay? The next one is the, uh, did I say committed? Or he's, he's connected, right? It's all about the ministry. He's committed. It's all about the mission. And what is the mission? The mission is to live like Jesus and to share his love. It's to go deeper with God. Okay, And then you have the fourth person, which is the catalyst. The catalyst Christian is a Christian that it's all about the move of God. It's all about the transformation. It's like, it's all about, you know, we're going to win the world for Jesus, and nothing's going to stop it. You fit that one good, Linda? There you go. There you go. So, so some people just come for a meal. See? Some people come just for the meal come and they're hearing the message for the first time, right? Um, some people come for many meals and sit for a while. Um, but at the church table, there's different people coming in different seasons. Some people come for a short time. Some come for a long time. But you know what doesn't change? is the food that we put on the table. This is, what, this is the word of God. This table represents the word of God. This is what we're feeding, the house of God. Amen. And so here's the thing. There's, there's an interesting effect that these four chairs have on each other. Okay, number one, let's talk about the curious. The curious must see the committed. Where's our committed? Right here. She, he has to be able to see her, okay, uh, and hear the connected and hear the catalyst. Why? Because the curious needs to see the committed. Why? Because the committed is living on mission. So the curious person has to see someone who's living like Jesus and loving like Jesus. The committed, ha- the one who's coming in as the curious ob- observer has to say, hey, that person's living for Jesus. I need to get to that place. Okay? They need to hear the connected to learn how to plug in. So the curious person is coming in and Bill's coming up to, to Chris and saying, hey man, I know you've been coming for a while, but you need to connect, man. You've got to come to small group because God wants to take you deeper. So Bill connects to small group and it's all about his ministry and, oh, I love my connect group, but in his connect group and in his involvement in the ministry, suddenly something changes in his heart and he says, I want to know Jesus more. It's no longer about the connect group. Now it's about getting close to Jesus. Connect group just becomes an instrument to get you there. Is this making sense? The curious person needs to hear the catalyst because a catalyst person will talk of stories of transformation. And this is, I have you sitting there for a reason because I know there was times even in the past where I was discouraged and I'd, Linda would come over and she'd start telling me about the miracles that God had did in her life when she only believed God and she trusted God and God took her through a fire. There was no money and, and I just prayed and I believed God and God brought in the money. And we need to hear the catalyst because the catalysts are the people who encourage us to press into the transforming power of God. And so how many know that each person is important at the table? So let's talk about the second person. If you want to hold up your sign, Bill, okay? It says connected. Okay, the connected need to see the catalyst. This person has to see this person in the church to hear uh, uh, and has to hear the curious and has to hear the committed because all of these players have a role. Why do they need to see the catalyst? To overcome Reluctancy. Sometimes we get reluctant. We need someone to come in that makes absolutely no sense. So, well, you know what? I'm doing everything. I'm committed. I'm going to church. I'm going through the motions. And, you know, I'm reading my Bible. But it just feels like I can't get the breakthrough. 
And then, then the catalyst comes in and makes absolutely no sense and says, oh, it's okay. God will take you through it. Just believe him. I'm going to pray for you, bless God. Let's hold hands. You know, you're going to go through this thing. And let me tell you, when I, was, I went through this, and this is how God got me up, and we need to hear the catalyst. Okay? The connected has to hear the curious to remind themselves the church is not just about them. Right? I'm going to say that again. They need to hear the curious to remind them that church is not just about them. If this chair goes empty, all of these seas, they go into cataracts. You can't see anymore. You can't hear. Because everything's about mission. We always need the curious coming into the church. If the curious don't come in, we get over spiritual, and now we can't relate to the world, and people no longer get saved. And we no longer live where people are at. We live above them. We need that curious seat. We need people coming in messed up, uh, you know, needing Jesus. We need that in order to stay healthy. Is this making sense to anybody? The connected have to hear the committed to know the potential of a church that is on mission. Those who are connected have to say, listen, I'm connected, and I'm going to small group, and I'm going to this, and I'm going to men's breakfast, and, and I really enjoy it, but, but, but I, I need to press in. I need to know Jesus more. And they move into that realm of growing deeper with Christ. The committed, can I see your sign there? Okay, so now we have the committed. The committed must see the curious and hear the connected and the catalyst. Why? They need to see the curious to remind themselves of how to relate and speak to those who don't know Christ or who are young believers. We need that. That's why I'm saying, as a church, we need to be able to relate to the curious. We need to be able to speak that language. We need to be able to get into their lives with the gospel. Okay? We need to hear the connected to care for those who are near. And we need to hear the catalyst to inspire them to win every battle for the sake of the kingdom. And so that's why this is important. And the last one is the catalyst. Say the catalyst. And because we're a spirit-filled church, we're, we naturally got a lot of catalyst people here. And, and, so, and I'm one of them. So I, we have to see the connected, hear the curious, and hear the committed. Why? To, in order to know... Okay, you have to see the connected to know that in order to grow larger, you must also grow smaller. There has to be that sticky factor. So these people here, the connected and the committed, will always take the catalyst people and say, yeah, I know we want a move of God, and I know we're going to win the world for Jesus, but we've got to care about the people coming in. We've got to pastor them. We've got to care for them. No, no, we just need the power of God. We just need revival. We just need to knock everyone over, and then, then, then everything will happen. No, we need to care for people. We need to be committed. and we, got, so we need each other, guys, is what I'm saying. And ultimately, the goal is to come in here and then move through the growth process as new people are coming in so that we all become catalysts, all become people that are pushing forward for the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Amen? So why does the catalyst need to hear the curious? To know how well the recipe is working for the meals. And I, I give this example because when I was pastoring in Kingston, you know, I'd worked so hard on my messages. And, but what I didn't realize was that I was, I was writing my messages and gearing my messages because I was assuming everybody was like me and they were a catalyst person. And so I'd get up and I'd preach my message and, I, and, I, and all of a sudden people would come up to me and say, that was the best message, brother. I got goosebumps. The anointing was flowing and the presence of God. And wow, I, I'm, this revelation is awesome. You're the greatest preacher. I'm like, yeah, I feel pretty good about myself, right? And then another person comes up who's a curious person who's in there hearing the gospel and said, you know what? You seem really excited up there and, and you know, Sounded good, but I didn't understand the thing you were talking about. And I said, we need to go for coffee, and we did. But something hit me there. I need to preach in such a way that I'm feeding the catalyst, I'm feeding the committed, I'm feeding the connected, and I'm feeding the curious. Because it's a big dinner table. Everybody needs to understand what's coming out. Another example is I went on a Bible school mission trip from St. Catharines, a group of us went down to help this church, and it was meeting in a school gym, and it was what I would call a catalyst church. It was all about 
everything was just about revival and the fire of God. And that's amazing. We love that stuff. But we went there, and I went in, and we had the worship team. I, my friend was playing the drums, and you know, my brother and was there doing stuff. And we were all ministering, helping this church. And there was about 150 chairs, and there was maybe 30 people sitting in those chairs. So, uh, so my friend on the drums said... Travis, we're gonna, he was a big evangelist. He goes, let's go across the parking lot. There's a Jehovah Witness, and they're having a service. Let's go and invite them to our service, because we got the real deal happening here. That's a great idea. So I went over with him, and we walked into the sanctuary. And there's about 200 chairs, and every chair was packed. And I said, man, you guys are full in here. Yeah, we have three services on Sunday, and we packed them all. And I was just like... Uh, well, we got a sanctuary of 150 people, and we got 30 people over there, but we got the real deal. You should come. And I sunk, completely sunk, because I realized something is that they were actually strategizing to go after the curious. They were going door to door in hope, if I can find one curious person, we can bring them into our church. And they were focusing on the curious, and they were running three services. What if we as a church with the Holy Ghost, with the anointing, with the fire, with the word, went after the curious. What would our church look like? Interesting thought. All right? So, the curious need to hear the committed to know the state of the whole family and to strategize healthy eating for all people. And, um, and I'll give you an example of that. When I'm sitting at the dinner table with my wife, I have teenagers and I have children. And not every conversation is appropriate for everyone at the table. And sometimes Sunday mornings like that, not every conversation can be mentally digested by everyone present in the room. So that's why God is teaching us how to operate in the Spirit, yet keep it at a level that everybody can receive. This is what God is doing. So what happens if someone vacates a chair? If somebody's missing in this chair, what happens is the church becomes unhealthy. Healthy churches make sure that they're reaching the curious, that they're reaching the committed, reaching the connected, and making a place for the catalyst. We need every person at that table. And when one one is missing, the kingdom stops to grow. And cataracts come over. The body, but when one person vacates the chair, you guys may be seated now. Thank you so much. You did a great job. Give him a hand. Thank you, guys. Luke chapter fourteen, verse fifteen to twenty-three. One of those at the table with Jesus heard these things and said to him, "Blessed are the people who will share in the meal in God's kingdom." Jesus said to him, "A man gave a big banquet and invited many people." Okay. And when it was time to eat, the man sent out his servant and told the guests, Come, everything is ready. But all the guests made excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field. I must go and look out for it. Please excuse me. Another said, I just bought five pairs of oxen. I must go and take care of them. Uh, Please excuse me. A third said, I just got married. Would you please? I can't come. I'm on my honeymoon, okay? And, And so the servant returned and told his master what had happened. And the master became angry and said, Go at once into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, bring in the crippled, bring in the blind, bring in the lame. And later the servant said to his master, I did what you commanded, but still, hey, we got lots of room. So the master said to the servant, go out into the roads and the country lanes and urge the people there to come so my house will be full. God wants to fill his house. God wants heaven to be filled. And and here's the thing we learn from this. There's There's three things we learn. Number one, next slide, is invite many. Okay? God wants us to invite many. We need to be out there inviting people. Come into the kingdom. You know, come. God's not holding your sin against you. He's paid for it. Come and be reconciled to God. Amen. There's, there's an inviting that has to happen. And the other thing we see is that there's still room. There's always room because God wants his house to be full. Amen. The next one is he, he wants us to urge the people to come in. That, that verse actually means to compel them. The Greek actually means with a sense of urgency. Come on in to the wedding 
feast of the Lamb. God is inviting you for dinner. And so today, we want to celebrate the Lord's table. I want to say something just about the catalyst, because I've been a catalyst for years. If you're, you know how you know you're a catalyst person? Is while I was preaching this message, John chapter 7 came to mind. And you thought, well, Jesus stood in front of the disciples and he said, if you don't drink my blood and eat my flesh, you'll have no part in me. And then many followed him no more. And he was left with just the 12. And we think, well, Jesus is just about the catalyst. He doesn't care. No, Jesus was practicing some time management. He's saying, listen, I've got three years here to raise up the leaders of the church. And I have too many people to minister to. So I'm going to tell them that they need to become cannibals. And then I'm not going to explain to them that it's actually symbolic of the Lord's Supper. So that they will leave so I can spend time with the people I need to spend time with. Because they're going to carry the mantle and they're going to birth the church. Ultimately, the goal is to move from here to here. But Jesus, this whole thing about it's just the remnant, that has to go. We're the remnant if we belong to Jesus. Amen? We're the remnant if we're walking in his ways and we're pursuing the Lord and we're going after him. But so many times people take things out of context. Is this making sense to anybody? Okay. So, so God is interested in all four seats at the table. Did this message make sense to anybody? Amen. And so, Father, help us to be a church that continues to grow and make, that we'd make room for everyone at the table, Lord. And I pray, wherever we're at, Lord, that we, we want to move higher in you. We want to move in to deep relationship with you. Father, I thank you for your amazing grace. I thank you for this amazing church. I thank you that we're, we're a church that we're willing to look at these issues and say, yeah, we want to be what you've called us to be in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said... Amen, amen.